come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome this time to the world of actuality. But a world more terrifying than any imaginary gothic romance of witches, ghouls, and goblins. The world of the mind, through whose secret chambers wander shapes and specters whose drives can be as weird, as hair-raising, as any ghost story. And the modern heroes who battle these forces of evil, who fight as bravely as any St. George against the dragons, are the psychiatrists. Male or female, consider the case of Dr. Margaret Hunter. Good night, Parksy. Oh, good night, Dr. Hunter. Now, don't be after going out the back way without the security guard. Oh, my car's only a short walk into the parking lot. Mm, so was poor Eileen. Do you know what happened to her? And even after that dirty scene had warned her. I know, but I'm not a nurse. <sighs> Nor as young, and thank heaven, I haven't had any phone calls yet. Well, you've got white on, and the sweet Lord knows you're pretty enough for any filthy-minded maniac like... Oh, doctor, what kind of man to want to rape a woman? Oh, that would take more than an elementary course in psychiatry to define. But now you've got me nervous enough, Parksy. I'll have the guard show me to my car. Night. <laughs> mystery drama, The Disembodied Voice, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Celeste Holm. It was a dark, overclouded evening, and the parking lot was deserted and forbidding. But the security guard was reassuring and saw Dr. Hunter safely into her car. Feeling slightly foolish, she locked her doors from the inside and rode home uneventfully. After parking the car in the basement of her multi-room apartment house, she entered the elevator again, feeling a little foolish at the slight nervousness she felt in the empty automatic elevator. But the elevator took her straight to her floor, and she entered her apartment and closed the door with an unaccustomed feeling of relief and annoyance that the phone was ringing. Hello? Yes? What did you say? Yes, I thought I heard you the first time. Uh, who are you? You're what? Well, really, if you're so desperate, it, it isn't a woman you need. It's a doctor. After that outburst, I'm quite sure you ought to see me. Because I happen to be a psychiatrist, and you're a very sick... Hello? Hello? Damn. Well, Dr. Margaret Hunter, your hand is shaking. What's the matter with you? College? Three years bed school? Seven years residency in psychiatry? And suddenly you're nervous because a man says some, quote, dirty things, unquote, to you over the phone? You should be concerned with the patient and his problem, not yourself. <sighs> At least this one didn't threaten to kill you after he'd had his way with you. Go to bed. You need some sleep. Uh. Uh. Yes? Oh, no. Not you again. Now, I'm not interested in any further suggestions. Believe me, I know variations you haven't even dreamed of. Hello? Oh, brother. If you knew just how much I'd like to make the same suggestion for you to do the same. Hello, service. Dr. Margaret Hunter. Intercept all calls and tell the hospital, unless it's an urgent emergency, I don't even want to let them through. I'm bushed. I've got to get some sleep. Thanks, Judy. Good night. If I can sleep now anymore. Morning, 
morning, Parksy. Still on duty? Good morning, Dr. Hunter. Mary Daly called in saying she would be a few minutes late, so I'm still covering. Oh, but you're in early. Yes, I didn't sleep too well. I got some anonymous John on the phone who kept kept me up most of the night with romantic notions and some others not quite so romantic. Well, now, didn't I tell you? Oh, heaven help us, it'll be the grim raper himself. The who? Well, that's what they're calling him in the tabloids. The one who called up two nurses on the phone and then killed them. I think with me he got the wrong number. Did you call the police? I talked to them this morning. Mm. They'll contact the phone company and I suppose put some kind of monitor on my line. And they might be able to trace the call. And then they could catch him and, and put him behind bars. I doubt if that would solve his problem. Well, it would solve yours. Keeping you awake the whole night. And scaring you half to death. You know, I'm not so scared as I am bushed. I need help a lot less than the man does. Or the young man I'm going to see now. If only we could find the magic key, Parksy. The what is that now? A, a key? And for what? To unlock the box we keep our brains in. And let all the creeping ancient bugaboos fly out and blow themselves out of the world. Oh, here comes Mary. Go on home, Parksy. Feed your old cat and water your flowers and count your blessings. Because there's nobody who doesn't love you. <laughs> Morning, Larry. Morning. Still feeling totally antisocial? What do you want from me? Thanks for the royal sweetness service. Heavy screen windows, restraining straps on my arms and legs. I guess I'm lucky I'm not in a straitjacket. Well, the nurses tell me you wouldn't stay in bed. They had to put you in restraint. There was no cop outside anymore. I figured I was free to get out of the cage a little. Well, I persuaded the police you didn't need a guard. You kind of let me down, you know. Well, how come? The little girl's mother lodged a pretty severe complaint against you. In your position, I want to keep it out of the papers. Why don't you just let me along? Larry, you're going to have to answer for what you did. If I can tell them the why, or understand the why, you may not have to be locked up. Look. Maybe I need a shrink, but I don't need a dame. I know you're ashamed of it and can't face yourself and would like to work out your hostility on someone, anyone, to try to wipe out your shame, but it won't work that way. You want to make one deal? What? Promise me you'll stick to your room and do what the nurses tell you. Look, I happen to be a fan of yours, and I want this to stay as small and as unimportant as I think it really is. We all flip one way or another because life is a little more than any of us can handle. Most people get away with it. Nobody knows. You're not most people. And with you, if anybody knows, the world knows. You don't want that. Oh, Lord, no. So we got a deal? You got a deal. Good. Now, for the record, I signed you in as a concussion case. You're just under observation till it can be written off. Forgotten. Cured. Dr. Hunter here. I'm on my way home. Do me a favor. Call my telephone service and tell them. I'm so pooped I haven't even the strength to dial. Dr. Hunter? Who's that? What happened to the light? Well, either burned out or someone knocked it out. Who are you? Oh, don't be alarmed, Doctor. Here, my credentials. Detective Sergeant Grant. Well, I'll have to take your identification on trust. It's so dark I can't see anything. What are you doing here? Well, you did call the police. I checked the hospital and found you were on your way home. I got up here and with the lights out, I thought I'd better hang around. Thank you. I appreciate the protection. Well, in your case, we're willing to go a little further. I'd like to come in and talk to you, if I may. Why not? Excuse me. Well, come in. If you wish. That was rather foolish, Dr. Hunter. You still haven't checked me out. <laughs> you want to know something? I'm honestly too tired to care. Anyway, I prefer to trust my instinct. It's more dependable than my knowledge of police credentials. Well, you have a nice place. Well, it looks better in the right light. 
How about that? Oh, better. I got the report on you when I came in this evening. Even without having met you, I, I thought this was rather a special case. Oh, why? Well, first, because your caller may be a man I'm sure you've read about in the papers. I hadn't, but one of our nurses tells me he's quite notorious. The Grim Raper? It isn't funny, Dr. Hunter. He's killed two nurses. Both of whom he'd warned in advance. Now, I hope you'll cooperate with us in trying to trap this man. I don't like the word trap. It has other connotations. The man is sick. I want to help you find him and cure him if possible. More important, to stop him from harming anyone else and destroying himself. So how do we do it? Well, it isn't quite that simple. This phone thing goes on all the time. And we don't know if the man who called you is the man who murdered those girls. Now, the phone company is more than cooperative. They go along when it's important. And in your case, they agree it is. Well, what's so special about me? Well, you're a psychiatrist. You don't uh, start at shadows. You can handle a man who's potentially dangerous. Uh. Now, for example, if by chance he should call tonight, I have everything set up at Central to trace the call. Your line is being monitored now. But you'll have to hold him on the phone as long as you can for the company to be sure of making a fix. Could you do that? I can try. I can also tell you that I'm just as anxious as you are. But I don't think my man has any connection with your Grim Raper. How do you know? I don't know. It's instinct. I just think the man who called me was no run-of-the-mill psychotic. I've got the feeling that he was, or is, a man with a temporary aberration. Mm. Wasn't it about this time that he called you last night? Yes. Well, someone who knows your habits has some idea of your schedule. Midnight. Is that about when he started last night? Yes, but it could be the hospital. Now, wait, as long as we dare. My service picks up after four rings. You have an extension in the kitchen? Yes. Okay, pick up. I'll get on the extension. Hello? Hello, my lovely. This is your unseen admirer. Why did you have to spoil it? I don't understand. What do you mean, spoil? You went to the police. No, really, I didn't... We would have been so wonderful together. All the things I told you we'd do... Now, it's over. No, wait. Why does it have to be? Give me a chance to tell you... You'll never be able to tell me anything. I'm going to put an end to it. Once and for all. Don't worry. It'll be quick. Farewell, my lovely. Damn. I'm afraid he got away. Hang up, Dr. Hunter, and let me check the phone company. I'm going to put an end to it once and for all. An end to what? To the obscene and furtive phone calls? Or does he mean to Dr. Margaret Hunter's life? I'll return shortly with Act Two. Margaret Hunter's reaction at her unwanted suitor's rejection is at first relief. Then, as a doctor, comes a feeling almost of guilt. Dangerous as he might have been, the man is in need of medical attention. But in the kitchen, checking with the phone company, Detective Sergeant Pete Grant is troubled, from his professional point of view, with a different reaction entirely. The anonymous caller's last words spell to him not necessarily goodbye but a dangerous threat. I don't suppose they were able to trace it. No. Nope. Well, that appears to be the end of that. My fault. I must have been clumsy. Well, I guess I ought to get along. You must be tired. Sorry I wasn't more help. You were a lot more than you know. Even though my conscience bugs me a little, I, I'm glad it's finally all over. It's kind of a spooky experience. Look, can I offer you a drink? Yes. I mean... Well, I don't want to scare you, but... But why? You may not be out of the woods yet. Anyway, I'm taking no chances till you are. Would you answer me a question? If you let me take the couch, it would be a welcome switch. You can have the chair. Mm. 
Now, the voice was disguised, of course, but are you sure it couldn't have belonged to anyone you know? Quite sure. Well, as sure as I can be. I mean, I'm reasonably certain it doesn't belong to any of the men, the friends I have. How about patients? Well, life has a way of going in cycles. There aren't any male patients that I'm treating at the moment whose uh, disturbances would drive them in this direction. Yes? Well, there's one boy at the hospital, but... What's his diagnosis? More or less a classic manic depressive. Well, could he have been the one who called you? I don't think so. Who hospitalized him? When? What was the reason? I don't want to talk about that boy. Why? Well, he's... He's quite a famous athlete. And this is the first time he's done anything like this. He comes from quite a troubled home. And his first chance at making a solid life for himself has been through his athletic prowess. He's with one of our local teams. And if the story ever gets in the press, his career will be... Well, if not over, it will be certainly over in this town. And he broke the law, right? Police case. Yes. He's on our detention floor for observation. Except I persuaded them to leave the police guard off. Why? I want a cure, not a conviction. Even the little girl's mother didn't want to press charges. The child was too young to have been affected by it. I made sure of that. What was the guy on the police blotter for? Well, nothing very pretty to have on your record. Indecent exposure. Uh, yeah, I quite agree. You take that right in your stride. Well, in my book, it's a symptom, not a crime. It doesn't need punishment. It needs treatment. Which is not always successful. Which is not always successful. In this case, though... In this case, how can you be sure it's only a symptom? Isn't an anonymous phone call just as indecent, particularly the early ones you received? Yes, but it wasn't Larry's voice. You said yourself the voice was disguised. I heard that. Even so, I don't think Larry could get that deep or so, so gruff. Look, just because the boy made one mistake... Oh, Dr. Hunter, believe it or not, on the psychiatric side, a cop sees almost as much as a doctor. I'm not leaning on this boy. I'm concerned for myself and for you. For myself, because this case of the guy who killed the two nurses at your hospital has been my baby from the start. Now, both of them reported obscene phone calls prior to what happened to them, but we couldn't pin the guy, and, and we didn't stop him. Well, this time, I'm not taking any chances, since at least there's a possible lead. I'm going down to the hospital right now. But he couldn't have called me. Are you sure? Well, he was under restraint until... What is it? I had him taken off restraint and heavy medication. He could have called me tonight if... Wait a minute. What are you doing? Checking with the hospital what time he was put under restraint. Couldn't have been Larry. Impossible. They had him in a wet sheet first at 11, till he promised to behave, and the rest of the night they had a harness on him. And the nurses were in and out. He couldn't have moved. And anyway, there's no phone in the room. Okay, that washes that out. Uh, Detective Sergeant... Heavens, what a mouthful that is. Do you have a name? Peter. Pete to my friend. <laughs> so far, you're still a friend. But speaking of being washed yeah, out... I know, Doctor, but I'm not quite ready to leave yet. Why not? Because you're too... To unconcerned for your own good. Now, what does that mean? I think I ought to shake you up a bit. The guy who's been calling you, how do you know you're through with him? He just said so, on the phone. Goodbye, my lovely, remember? And he also said, I'm going to put an end to it. Maybe that's what he said to the two nurses before he raped and killed them. Now, this case isn't closed yet, Doctor. Now, I want to ask you to be careful. I wish we had enough personnel to cover you around the clock, but we haven't. Would you like a gun? No, thanks. Not my style. Besides, I wouldn't know how to use it. Well, then at least promise me to take it easy. You know, Don't travel alone. Keep your car doors locked. Keep the chain on your door when you open it. This is my home phone. If you can't reach me at the precinct number, the precinct number's there. The badge number is 352. I don't need a number. I have a name. Thanks, Pete Grant, P.D. Don't mention it, Margaret Hunter, M.D. I appreciate your concern, Sergeant. But I think it's all over for me, so I'll say goodbye. 
I don't like your choice of phrase. Which one? Both of them. <laughs> I hope this isn't goodbye. For personal reasons, I mean, of course. It's been nice meeting you, Doctor. Same here. We could even things up a bit. It's Margaret. My friends call me Marge. Good night, Marge. Good night, Pete. I'm not leaving till I hear those bolts go home and the chain on. Okay, Bulldog Drummond. Satisfied? For the night, anyway. <laughs> you should have listened more closely to your mother, Marge. A policeman is your friend. <laughs> Good afternoon, Dr. Hunter. Hi, Parksy. Ah, you're on your way to see Larry Hamden. Right. Well, he's been waiting for you all day. And a plainclothes policeman was in to see him early this morning. Did he upset him? No, not the way I understand it. Now, Larry's been a doll ever since you had the talk with him yesterday. And I just don't see the sense in keeping him here anymore. Tying up a room we could use. Well, I'm glad everyone else is busy arranging his future. Do you think it might be all right if his doctor gives him a checkover? Oh, well, no. I don't need a kick in the behind to know my leg is being pulled, Dr. Hunter. And you know I wouldn't give you a bum steer. Go and see the boy for yourself. Uh, that cop told me how you took up for me and what's been going on around here. I sure owe you a vote of thanks all the way down the line. I've got a season pass at the stadium, Larry. I want to see you out there again as soon as the team's back off the road. When do we start our session so I can understand why I could have ever done a thing... a dumb thing like I did? I told you today was our first. I'm going to leave you to get dressed. Then I'm going to march you down and sign you out. And then I'll walk you to the bus and we'll talk on the way. Then you'll go home. Now, starting tomorrow, I'll see you twice a week after practice. And the story, as far as anyone else is concerned, is what I said at the beginning. You had a slight concussion which cleared itself up physically. You were only on the psycho floor for observation. You know, Doc, you are something else. <laughs> Wait you get my bill. You just write the figure. I'll pay it. <laughs> There's another dude who thinks you're something else, too. Oh, who? Mm. The cop who checked me out this morning. But he's worried about you. Oh? He's written me off as the nut who's after you, but he still feels you're in danger. How'd you like a defensive tight end who goes 235 in top shape as your bodyguard? You solve your own problems, Larry. I can handle mine. But thanks, anyway. Go on now, get dressed, and let's get out of here. <laughs> Dr. Hunter, I'm going home. I don't expect to be taking any calls. But you leave me live till I cut you off. If I don't answer by four rings, forget it and just take the message. That's right. No, if I don't answer, I'm out and can't be reached. Thanks, Judy. Night. Oh, Dr. Hunter. Uh, yeah? Well, I, I, I wonder, would you mind... Could you help me back to bed? Why, of course. Where's your room? It's just down the hall. Oh, I appreciate this. I, I just guess I'm not quite as strong as I thought I was. <laughs> I just had a baby, you know. Congratulations. Oh, this is my room. Now, if, if you could just help me in, into bed. Use the step. Uh-huh. Here we go. Oh, there. Oh, thank you. That feels good. <laughs> my husband's coming to see me any minute now, and I, I wanted to be on my feet. Well, no sense in hurrying it. But I, I'd like you to meet him. Well, I, it's, it's rather late, and I... Oh, you don't recognize me, do you? Should I? You do seem a little familiar somehow, but I'm afraid I so seldom get to the maternity oh, pavilion. No, no, you wouldn't know me from here. It's, well, it's just that I live in the same apartment building as you. Oh. Yeah, my name is Louise. Uh, I'm Mrs. Charles Benson. Well, how do you do? <laughs> I should apologize, but I'm afraid I'm a typical cliff dweller. I'm there so little, I don't know any of my neighbors. Oh, that's all right. You're a busy doctor, and well, we don't even live on the same elevator bank, but... Well, you're like well-known, I, I, I mean, a woman psychiatrist and all, and, well, I'm just glad that I have the chance to say hello. Me too. I wish you could wait to say hello to my husband. He, he's the 
the one first pointed you out. Well, I wish I could, too, but I've had a long day, and I really must get home. Tell your husband I'm sorry I oh, missed please. him. please. And... Here he is. Here he is now. Charles? Charles, will you look who helped me back into bed? Dr. Margaret Hunter from our old building. Well, how do you do, Mr. Benson? I do. Know. My congratulations on your new baby. And now I really have to run. But, Charlie, what's the matter with you? That cat got you done? I'll leave you two alone. Charlie, that wasn't very polite. Hello, my lovely. Don't you look wonderful? What? Hello, my lovely. <laughs> My lovely, scarcely the most modern of phrases, a little stilted and old-fashioned. Still not necessarily that individual or damning, and Margaret Hunter was too tired and hungry to make any more of it, which was her mistake, as we shall see when we return shortly with Act Three. It was a weary Dr. Hunter who ate a light dinner at the hospital cafeteria and then headed for home. There comes a moment of exhaustion when the mind simply suspends itself and refuses to function any further. Coming out of the elevator to her apartment, she was even too tired to be annoyed that once again the hall light was out and she had to scrabble with her key by feel to open the door. But she was rudely awakened to full perception as the door opened and with a silent rush, a gloved hand was over her mouth, the other arm pinioning hers to her side. Don't scream. Please, don't scream. Just move inside. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Now, I'm going to take my hand off your mouth. But don't scream. I warn you, I have a knife and a gun. Well, I have no intention of screaming, Mr. Benson. You know who I am? I'm reasonably sure it's the voice I heard at the hospital this afternoon. Now, would you let me go? <laughs> if, if I do, promise not to make me do something I'll be sorry for? It's a promise I'm glad to make. I don't want anything to happen that we'll both be sorry for. Can I trust you? Well, that's my question. Can I trust you? Come in. Mrs. Benson? Yes. My name is Pete Grant. I thought I might find your husband here. Oh, Charles was here, but he left early. He had a lot of work to catch up on. Are, are you from his office? Uh, no, I, I have some business with him. When did he leave? Oh, <laughs> about an hour ago. I could call him at the house. Oh, that's all right. I, I can catch him some other time. Oh, I'll call him myself. I'm sorry to bother you. Oh, it's no bother. I wish you could stay and chat. I wish I could, too. But uh, this is a busy evening for me. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> have to answer it. It might be the hospital. No! Let her ring. If you insist. I have to, Margaret. I can't let Louise be hurt. Now, when she's finally had the baby we always wanted, it would kill her. Kill? Is that what I have to do? What? Why did it stop ringing? Why did the phone stop ringing? I have a service that intercepts. After the phone rings? Yes. And that means you're not home. Good. Now give us a little time together before... You'll give us time. Look, service, I'm calling from the hospital. I understand, but this is police business. Oh, I don't care what Dr. Hunter told you. You keep ringing her till you get through to her. Yes, I'll hang on. I thought you said the service intercepts. It's supposed to. Then why don't they? It must be some emergency. That ring is driving me mad. Don't you have a cutoff switch or something? Only on my bedroom. Well, go in there. If you just let me... I told you I had a knife. 
proof. All right, I'm moving. Just don't do anything foolish. Don't you. Now cut off the phone by the bed. Quick! All right, all right. Damn! Will it never stop? Maybe if you let... If you let me tell the service not to put through any calls. No, no, no. Stay away from the phone. If we wait long enough, they'll give up. Yeah. That's better. I thought you'd never know who... And now... Now you hold my whole life in your hands, Margaret. Once... I might have wanted that. But not now. Now that Louise has had the baby. I have to think of her first. I have to protect her. Don't you see? You see that, don't you? What else can I do but kill you? What else can I do? You could face your real problem. Huh? What problem? That you need help. Psychiatric help. Aren't you afraid of me, Margaret? No. Why not? Because if I were, you might kill me, Charles. Why do you call me Charles? You call me Margaret. That's the way I always thought of you. Margaret. And I had no right. Not with Louise. Well, you, you see, she must never know. You see that, don't you? I, I have to get rid of you. Then there's no one to tell her. That makes sense. On a pathological level. You... You understand? I understand a great deal about you, Charles. You think I'm mad, don't you? Insane. Uh, lunatic. I do not. You said pathologic. That's a scientific word. The others don't mean anything. Oh, uh, you think I'm sick? What do you think, Charles? I, I'm not sick. I'm just... That cold is too tight. It's hard to breathe. You don't know what it's like. You, you couldn't understand. Look, I never had a girl. Any other girl but Louise. Well, she's not pretty, but she's a good girl. We were married after college. I was never any good with people. I was too shy. I, I was even worse with girls. Talking, dating, everything. Louise understood she was so patient. Except for the child. We never could have a child like she wanted. We went to doctors for years and years. Uh, I hated it. What business was it of theirs? Our private life. Uh, what did they think? Did they think I was the one to blame? Were you? No. Well, you see, we worked it out. We did have a child. You worked it out. Or the doctors. What's the difference? Well, anyway, there were other things. Louise was having the baby. She didn't need me anymore. She didn't want me that way. All she thought about was the, the baby. And I was alone again. I was more alone than I'd ever been in my life. Is that when you started calling women on the phone? I wanted to frighten them, to hurt them, to get back at some women for what Louise was doing to me. I... I only did it twice. And each time afterwards, I was sick and ashamed of myself. What kind of man was I? How could I do such a thing? I, I, I couldn't explain it to myself. I... You could have gone to a psychiatrist. No. He could have helped. No. How could I even begin to tell him about myself, what I'd done? 
How, how, how could I talk about such, such, such private things, even to a psychiatrist? Well, you're talking to one now. I know. I knew you were in the building. The first time I called, I, the first t -t time I called, I was going, going to ask for help. I was all alone downstairs in the apartment. The walls were closing in on me, so I l looked up your number and I called. And then when I heard your voice, I... All I could think of was you. Soft and warm in a bed. Alone. Like me. Alone. The whole world was against me. Making me alone. And so I wanted to... I wanted... Oh. I wanted... <laughs> Poor Charles. Why didn't you follow your first impulse before it was too late? Is it too late? You can't help me now. Give me the knife, Charles. Knife? Ah, uh, where did I have it? Oh, yeah, here. Here. Margaret, what am I going to do? I don't know. I wish I could buy back time for you, Charles, and for your poor wife. But it's too late. The girls are dead. What girls? The nurses you raped and murdered. Isn't that what you were planning to do to me, too? What nurses? The ones you called on the phone before you called... Charles, listen to me. Those first two women, how did you find their numbers? Find them? Hmm. Well, I just picked them at random out of the phone book. They weren't nurses that worked in my hospital? I don't know. I... Then you're not the man in the papers. The one they called the Grim Raper. That murderer? What kind of a monster do you think I am? I never saw either of those other two women. Oh, Charles, then there is hope for you. Hey, who's that? I don't know. Open up, Martha. It's police. Me, Pete. The, the police? Sure we are. I put that knife down. I told you I had a gun. Well, I'm, well, I'm coming in. Trust you. I didn't know he was coming, Charles. Martha, are you in there? Are you all right? Of course I'm all right. Warning, Vincent, if he's in there with you, there are three of us and we're all armed. Now, I'll have to kill you and myself. Oh, don't be a silly boy, Charles. Give me that gun. Uh, that's better. You can come in now, Pete. And you can put your gun away, too, Detective Grant. I think you'll find that Mr. Benson and I have solved all our problems. <laughs> Sweet home. Well, the candle in the window still isn't burning very bright. Oh, you mean that bulb. I'll get the super to replace it in the morning. I wonder if Benson was responsible for that. Oh, let's not blame any more on him. Blame? I'd like to have given him one good shot for putting you through what he did. Lady, you sure have got. <laughs> How did you happen to come charging up like St. George in time to save the lady from the dragon? Oh, that's simple. I got interested from the very beginning in the case. Oh? Now, once we picked up the other guy this morning, the one responsible for the nurses, I got to thinking about you. The case, I mean. How did the guy know you'd call the police in unless it was someone right in the building? So I ran a building check and came up with three possibles. Three possible what? Lone birds who might take a notion to make naughty phone calls. Singles. One, salesman out of town. Two, a guy whose MC at a nightclub was in the middle of his act when the phone call came the night I was here. So, it looked like it had to be number three, Benson. And it was. Can you really cure him, do you think? Well, I haven't had time to evaluate his case, but I'm optimistic. Drink? No, thanks. Yeah, we're both beat. I still have to get a statement from you to close the file. I'll give it to you right now. Oh, there's no hurry. It'd give us a chance to meet again and, and for me to get up enough courage to ask a question. Uh, good night, Mark. Good night, Pete. Oh, brother, Pete was right. I am beat. It's getting to be a lifestyle. Tonight, nothing keeps me awake. Uh-oh, just to be on the safe side. Lock it up. 
and so to bed with no more interruptions. Oh, no, not again. There can't be any more left. Hello? Marge, it's Pete, calling from the lobby. Did you lock up? Yes, sir. Uh, I thought maybe I'd better ask my question tonight. All right. What is it? Do uh, lady psychiatrists ever go out with lonely detectives with no psychological problems? Like tomorrow night? <laughs> the girl gets the darndest phone calls. But I like this one. Why not, Pete? Why not? <laughs> through the haunted hallways of the mind. I wonder if Dr. Margaret Hunter ever located the golden key in Charles Benson's case. Hmm. Now that's interesting. I wonder also if men ever receive obscene phone calls from lonely ladies. Only one way to find out. I'll let you know when I return shortly. As a matter of fact, Dr. Hunter did find that golden key, and Charles Benson did find a cure for his schizoid tendencies. Well, at least his paranoia. And just as Margaret Hunter had predicted, Louise was patient and understanding, and most of all, forgiving. They pass each other every so often in the hall and nod pleasantly. Neighbors, if not friends, something else. Oh, yes, that phone call. Just a wrong number. Still, for a long while, every time I pick up a phone, and perhaps you too, will have just a momentary flutter of butterflies under the heart. Our cast included Celeste Holm, Wesley Addy, Robert Dryden, and Mildred Clinton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. AM Seattle. CBS News. A man in St. Joseph, Missouri, seized a Continental Trailways bus tonight and threatened to kill two women hostages unless police let him and his brother leave the city. I'm Jim Kilpatrick reporting on the CBS radio network. The brother was arrested earlier in a bar. The man finally agreed to trade the two women hostages for two policemen. He then demanded a police car to make his getaway. They were given a police car to use to leave the area, and they are now in the process of trying to drive away from the area. And we have got the sister down from Lincoln, and she is talking to the brothers over the air now. A police officer in St. Joseph, Missouri. The sister is talking via police radio. Former White House Counsel Charles Colson sentenced to a maximum of three years for obstruction of justice in the Ellsberg case was released from prison Friday evening after serving only seven months. He is home tonight with his wife. It really has been an experience that we're going to have to put together. I'm very grateful that Judge Gazelle showed compassion and got him home to us because we need him. Mrs. Colson apparently referring to Judge Gazelle's statement that the sentence was shortened because of serious family difficulties. Colson was the last of the Nixon White House associates to be released. John Dean, Jeb Stewart Magruder, and Herbert Comback were freed earlier. You, you felt a little bit lonely that, that first night with the other three gone, and I was still there. Uh, you hoped you weren't forgotten, but I, I knew I wasn't. 
You said you'd never forget the others you met in prison. Will you stay in contact with them? I hope to. That's one of the things that Freddie and I are planning to do, is to go back to uh, Maxwell to visit with some of the men that I spent a lot of time there with this past fall. Colson talking with newsmen tonight. President Ford's $1 per barrel tariff on imported petroleum is in effect along the eastern Gulf Coast. Weather is a problem in Texas, and many ships fail to make the deadline. The uh, Houston Ship Channel uh, is, is still fogged in. It has been for, for several days now. Uh, uh, we have two tankers uh, carrying almost a million barrels of crude, and we don't know whether or not the fog is, is going to lift tonight. Exxon spokesman Chuck, Chuck Bushnell. The deadline is still two hours away on the Pacific coast, and San Francisco Harbor authorities report no rush to beat the deadline. We have one ship, the SS Kaleo, from Chevron, who is trying to make it in. And if they beat the tide situation, they will arrive before the deadline. There's been no uh, surge of shipping trying to beat this deadline. There has been no change of schedules. Senator Kennedy says President Ford's tariff on U.S. oil imports is an overreaction to the energy problem and threatens serious damage to the nation's economy. I propose the introduction on a gradual, deliberate basis of a mandatory allocation program for gasoline with parallel quotas on gasoline and crude imports. But this not, must not be a sudden drastic program that will twist our economy out of shape, drive up the oil price, and bring back long lines at the gasoline station. And we should review this modest allocation program every six months to see its effects on consumption and overall economy. Senator Kennedy also said he would place a tax on gas-guzzling cars. The Federal Court of Appeals will hear arguments Saturday afternoon on who owns the Nixon White House material. Friday District Judge Charles Ritchie ruled the government, not Mr. Nixon, owns the material. The appeals court stayed the ruling pending Saturday's hearing.